Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining us. On behalf of the Environmental Finance Center Network, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, Blending Source Water Protection into Asset Management. My name is Tess Clark. I work here at the Syracuse University Environmental Finance Center. And before we get started, I'm gonna quickly go over logistics and also some details about our network. For today's session, everyone is gonna be on mute to ensure audio quality. If you have a question, just go ahead and type it into the GoToWebinar question dialog box at any time. There will be some uh, time for a short Q&A at the end of the session. If you are having technological difficulties, feel free to also use the question dialog box and I'll do my best to help you. We will be making today's slides available as well as a video recording on the EFCN website. You can reach that website at www.efcnetwork.org. Please allow two weeks for the processing and posting of these materials. As a courtesy, we like to provide a certificate of attendance for participating in our webinars. This webinar has not been submitted to licensing agencies for pre-approval of continuing education credits. You will need to check with your licensing agency directly if you're interested in receiving any type of credit. You must attend the entire 60-minute session by logging into GoToWebinar with your unique registration link in order to receive a certificate. If you watch the webinar with a friend or are not directly logged in, we won't have a record of your attendance, so we can't send a certificate in that case. So make sure that you're uh, logged in on GoToWebinar. Uh, we will be sending the certificates via email within 30 days, and you can keep that for your records or use it to document or self-submit hours, whatever you want. This session is one of several webinars conducted by the Environmental Finance Center Network for the Smart Management for Small Water Systems project. Through this project, we provide training and technical assistance to small public water systems in the US states and territories to help local water systems achieve their goals and <laughs> stay in compliance with the Safe Drinking Water Act. And here you can take a look at our small systems team. Our network is national and we have centers based everywhere from Syracuse to Sacramento. And here you can see the areas of expertise that the EFCN focuses on. We provide workshops, trainings, and direct technical assistance on all the topics you can see below. That includes things like asset management, rate setting and fiscal planning, energy management, and much more. You know, and for example, today we'll be talking about a special topic, which is how asset management can help you create source water protection. And on that note, I'd like to introduce our presenter for today, uh, Heather Himmelberger. Heather is a registered professional engineer in environmental engineering, specializing in water and wastewater issues. She has been the director of the New Mexico Environmental Finance Center, which serves EPA Region 6 since 1996. She has more than 20 years of experience in all areas of engineering, environmental engineering, including planning, design, operation, and troubleshooting. So welcome, Heather. We're excited to have you on today, and I'm going to um, hand you over uh, screen control. All right. Um, oh, here we go. Good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, depending on what part of the country you're in right now. And welcome to today's webinar. And I wanted to just make an apology. I've been suffering from a cold for about the past week, and I'm not completely recovered from that. So I apologize for my voice today. Um, and hopefully it will last throughout the entire webinar today. But but again, my apologies for that. And then welcome to the topic today, which we're gonna talk about asset management and blending your source water protection program into asset management. So let's start today by just talking a few words about what source water protection is so that everybody kind of has an idea of what source water protection is all about. So source water is really any source of water that provides the community drinking water. So it might be a surface water source, such as a river or lake stream, it might be a groundwater source, or it might be a spring source. And source water protection, or source water can, be con can become contaminated from any number of different potential sources of contamination. Those might be um, industrial in nature, they might be from businesses, they might be from agriculture, or you know, any number of other kinds of contamination sources. Anything that you do that helps protect those sources, that collection of protection measures becomes your source water protection program. Most of the time those programs are voluntary, but there might be a few occasions where regulatory programs can come into play. 
And the overall purpose of the entire program is to reduce the risk of contamination to your source or prevent contamination from getting into the source. So we protect the source for the benefits. There's three different kinds of benefits that we think about. One is financial, another is environmental, and the last is social. And you'll often hear these three things together and they're called the triple bottom line. So it's looking at you know, financial, environmental, and social in a holistic, comprehensive way. There are a lot of financial reasons to want to undertake source water protection. It's a lot cheaper to prevent contamination than to eliminate it after it occurs. Some folks might think you don't need to really worry about whether contamination occurs within a source because they think, well, if it gets there, I'll just treat it. The problem is it can be very, very expensive to treat. It can be complicated and costs a lot to run it, to build it. You might need a higher level operator. And in some cases, the source of contamination might be such that maybe there isn't a really good treatment option. So it's far better economically to really prevent the contamination rather than dealing with it after the fact. And if some massive event were to occur in which your source does become contaminated, there may be legal consequences. There may be legal costs and fees associated with that. So preventing those costs can also be an important consideration. In addition to thinking about financial reasons or environmental reasons to protect our sources. So if we protect our sources of drinking water from having contamination enter them, it actually helps the environment. So for example, if you have a surface water source and you prevent contamination from entering that surface water source, the animals that live there, the fish, the amphibians, the insects that make their home in those surface water sources, um, will be protected as well. So it's a good thing for the environment as well as our drinking water sources. And finally, when we think about social reasons, we're thinking about people. This is both our employees and our customers. So thinking about you know, how we can keep the ease of treatment going forward good for our employees uh, by not having contamination that requires extensive treatment is a good thing for them. By being good stewards of the environment and public health is good for our customers. If our customers use our sources of water for other purposes, like recreational purposes, there are really good benefits there where protecting the water for drinking purposes also helps protect it for recreational purposes. We can also think about potential concerns for contamination. Here's just one example that primarily is from agricultural sources. Um, this is a map from the USGS about the potential for nitrogen contamination in our groundwater sources. The bluer it looks on the, on the state or on the area, the more potential for nitrogen contamination in the drinking water. Why might we care, care about nitrogen contamination? Well, one reason is there's a, a illness called blue baby syndrome that could affect very young babies um, if they drink water with too much nitrate in it. And we don't want that to happen. So we really want to prevent nitrogen contamination. Um, it also can affect surface water sources by causing algal blooms and that sort of thing. So we really want to think about how we can try to prevent that type of contamination. We also want to think about the potential for harmful incidents to occur. One that occurred about 20 years ago now in Walkerton, Canada was a real um, horrible incident where E. coli from an agricultural field got into a well. Uh, many people got sick and some people died. Um, it was a very tragic event. It actually changed the laws in Canada and really caused people to have to consider source water and how to protect it. That particular incident had a combination of things where there was potential source of contamination in an agricultural field, as well as a heavy rain event. So the um, change in uh, precipitation in that particular event also helped add to the problem there. So that gets us into climate change impacts. Over time, the climate um, has changed, which affects how the water resources actually happen now. So the amount of rain has changed from place to place. Sometimes it's more, sometimes it's less, sometimes it's more intense. And that can have an impact on our sources of drinking water. 
And we need to be aware of that because if we have more intense rainfall, things that may not have been sources of contamination before may be sources of contamination now. So we really have to think about what's happening with our weather patterns. Are we losing the potential to change from one source to another because you know, some types of sources are drying up? Are we having more potential impacts based on heavier rainfalls, more intense rainfalls, that sort of thing? So don't forget about that when you're thinking about your sources and how your sources might be affected by various things. Uh, while source water protection can be very important, we don't always do it. And one of the primary reasons that we don't do it as much as we um, should is that it's considered a voluntary program. But we wanna think about the fact that everything a utility does is not mandatory. There's a lot of activities that a utility does on a day-to-day -day basis, month-to-month -month basis, that are not mandatory. So something can be voluntary, but still very important. So keep that in mind that even though it is um, technically mostly a voluntary program, you still might wanna do it because it's extremely important for your customers and for your utility. So while well, source water protection can be more important for some utilities than others, everyone really should consider source water protection in the overall context of their planning, their management, their operation of their utility. So source water protection has six basic steps, uh, vision, source water characterization, program goals, implementation, or, sorry, action plan, implementation, and evaluation and revision. Now we're gonna pause for just a moment and take a couple of poll questions to find out if any of the members of our audience today are actually involved in source water protection activities. So Tess, if you could do our two poll questions related to source water. Sure. <laughs> um, the first question is, have you started source water protection planning efforts at your water system? So I think this can mean things like creating that vision statement, like Heather was just saying, maybe you don't have a formal plan yet, but you've started undertaking some specific efforts. So go ahead and say it, tell us whether it's a yes, no, not sure, or go ahead and also say if you're not a water system. And I think we'll just give you a couple more seconds to respond here. It looks like almost everyone has put in a response. So I'm gonna close this in three, two, and one. Great, so of the uh, water systems on today, 21% have considered some source water protection planning efforts, which is a pretty good amount. 9% um, say no, and 6% aren't sure. So I'm gonna go ahead and close that one. And then the second question about source water protection planning is as follows. Have you started or completed a source water protection plan for your water system? So here you can tell us, yes, we have completed a plan. Yes, a partially completed plan. No, but we're thinking about it. No, definitely not, or not sure. So I'm gonna go ahead and let everyone respond. It looks like a couple people have started to respond. I'm gonna give you uh, three more seconds just to get your response in. So three, two, and let's go ahead and close the poll now. All right, and the results here are pretty um, evenly between no and not sure. 30% say no, 30% aren't sure, but 13%, yes, they do have a plan. 9% um, has a partially completed plan, and 17% are actually thinking about it. So that's a good am amount of people that are in the process of considering a plan. So that's good to hear. All right, Heather, I'll let you get back to it. This uh, poll well, should be gone. Thank you all now. for. Um... Yeah, thank you all for participating in that poll. And it's good to see that there are members of the audience today that have actually gone all the way to creating a source water protection plan. So that's great to hear. So now we're gonna move on. We've talked a little bit about source water protection. Let's talk a little bit about what asset management is all about. So we wanna remember that water utilities exist for one main reason, and that's to serve our customers. So we wanna think about what our customers want. And probably the most important thing to most customers is that whenever they go to the tap and turn on the water, it's there. So reliability, you know, 24 seven water. Uh, they also want it to be high quality, safe for their kids or pets, et cetera. And they wanna have some customer service if they, you know, call 
call you for some questions or whatever that you'll be there. And then maybe fire flow, good pressure, those types of things. So there are some things that our customers want and they expect a lot. So then we might ask, you know, what do our customers want to pay? And I very specifically use the word want to pay as opposed to, you know, willing to pay or ability to pay. Because even customers that are willing or able to pay don't necessarily want to pay a lot for water. Uh, generally speaking, customers really think water should be free or very low cost. Um, we've kind of had that ingrained in us that, you know, water should be cheap. So generally speaking, most of our customers want to pay very little and a lot of our elected leaders or decision makers who are in the position of deciding how much to charge for water take that to heart and don't really want to make people pay very much for water. So we end up with competing objectives or priorities where we're supposed to deliver exceptional service at a really low cost. But the truth of the matter is we can't actually do everything for nothing. We can't have world-class best utility ever with you know, very limited resources. So what we have to do instead is really think about a way to focus our efforts, our resources in the best way possible. So we might want to gain more revenue into our utility, which is a fine goal. But in the meantime, we have to think about how best to really focus what we have. So what is that money, the resources, the time that we have available? How can we best spend that so we have the most impact possible? So asset management is really designed to provide that strategic direction or framework to help utilities or pretty much any other organization really think through those kinds of decisions of, you know, where should I put my money? So if you want to think about it in this little analogy that's on the screen now, so on the right-hand side, we have a rectangular box. And in that rectangular box, you see a bunch of different colored boxes. So think about that as the sort of the total activities that you have to do to keep your utility running well. So things like replacing assets or record keeping or operations, you know, all of that collection of stuff. And if you had your choice, you would do everything in that rectangle. You would get it all done. Then look at the box on the left, which is green, and that's the resources, the money, the personal t personnel time, that sort of thing that you have available to get the activities done. And you notice the green box is not as big as the box with the all the different colors. And that's the way it is for most utilities. You don't have enough resources and money and time to do everything you want. So what do we have to do? We have to figure out where the best place to put that money and time to get the most appropriate activities done because we can't do everything. And we also have to remember that if we spend money on one thing, we don't have it to spend on something else. So we really have to make sure that whatever we are spending it on, that's the best place to put it. It isn't the only place, it's the best place. So asset management is really designed to help you make those decisions of where to put your limited resources to have the best outcomes and use your information to make really good data-driven <clears throat> data decisions. So we wanna have a strategic way to focus those efforts, resources, activities, again, to address our competing priorities. In a definitional sense, asset management is providing the framework to help utilities provide the desired level of service at the lowest life cycle cost. So desired level of service is what you want your assets to provide. <coughs> and then the lowest life cycle cost is that best appropriate cost. This is not about driving the cost to zero, but rather what should the cost be to provide that excellent service that you're providing to your customers. So asset management has five core components, the current state of the assets, level of service, criticality, life cycle costing, and long-term funding. It turns out that it's not actually linear like I just showed it, but sometimes in a linear form, it's kind of easier to understand. It's actually circular. You don't really have a beginning or an end, so you'd never get finished with asset management. And you start asset management wherever you are. You can't go back to the beginning of time and say, okay, let's start over when our community didn't have a water system and let's build it the way we want. You just are stuck with whatever you had, you know, whoever put that system in place when you got it, that's the way it is and that's fine. You just take where you are and just move forward. So we have to remember again, it's 
just sort of an ongoing process that we do all the time. And now, Tess, we have a couple of poll questions related to asset management. So if you could take it away and do those couple of poll questions. Sure. So these are similar to our last set of polls. The first one is, have you started asset management planning efforts at your water system? So you can respond yes, no, not sure, not a water system here. And this doesn't mean you have a formal plan. It just means you've started doing, looking at your level of service or done, you know, maybe looked at some of your assets and thought about them and uh, just in a more general sense. So go ahead and let us know. It looks like we have almost everyone responding. So I'm going to go ahead and close this in three, two, and one. And as far as the results, 33% say yes, they've started asset management planning efforts at their water system, 3% are solidly no, and then we have a good number of folks here who aren't water systems and a couple people who aren't sure. So that was our first poll, and I think you can guess what the second poll is. But the second one, we're asking you, have you started or completed an asset management plan for your water system? So if you have a plan and complete, you can say yes. If you're in the middle of planning, you can say yes, partially completed. And then also tell us if you're um, thinking about it, if you don't have a plan and you, you're not thinking about it, and then also if you're not sure. So it looks like we have a good number of people have already responded, but if you're still thinking about it, you can just take a couple more seconds. I am gonna close it in three, two, and one. All right, and for the results, um, a good majority of folks, 38%, have a partially completed plan. 12% on the call today do have a complete plan. And then 8% um, are thinking about it. 38% uh, are solidly no, they don't have an asset manage plan, management plan, and 4% aren't sure. So that's a good place to start. I'm going to go ahead and close that for now and yeah I'll hand it back over to you Heather. Well thank you everyone for completing that poll and it's um, interesting to see that we have quite a few people who have done both asset management and uh, source water protection so that's great to see. So our next part is to say well if asset management really provides that good framework for the overall utility and making decisions and if source water protection is or should be an integral part of the planning, operation, maintenance of the utility, then it seems only logical that we should be able to blend source water, source water protection into the asset management program of the utility. So how might these two programs tie together and what are the logical connections between the two? So we look at asset management again, what are the five core components of asset management that are listed there on the left and the six, um, aspects of source water protection on the right, how can these things fit together? And we're gonna go through some ties between the two programs and how they can be blended. Uh, the first one we're gonna talk about is level of service, which relates to the source water protection vision and program goals. So the first part is really establishing an overall mission. And why might you wanna have a mission statement for utility? Well, it will set the overall direction for the utility show what your leadership, your elected leaders, your decision makers, whatever kind of group runs your utility, what is most important to them, and get everybody on the same page for how you're really focusing all of your efforts at the utility. Similarly, you want an overall mission and vision for the source water protection plan. Here's just a general vision for source water. Um, you can have something you know, far different from this, but this is just a general vision that source water protection is essential for providing a reliable supply of high quality drinking water. And our community water supply will be protected by an active source water protection plan. So just showing that the utility considers um, source water protection essential to keeping that high quality, reliable, safe of water, or reliable source of water there, and that they will protect it from any kind of contamination um, as much as possible by a source water protection plan. So out of this overall mission statement will come the level of service goals. So those individual things that a utility wants to do um, to have good water service and in a, in a moment we'll talk about the source water protection piece. 
So on the screen are just a couple of examples of general goals for water utilities. We want goals to be very specific, exactly what you want to do. We want them to be measurable, attainable, relevant, and time bound. Um, sometimes the time bound is not necessary, but the other four goals we want to include when we set goals. And the level of service goals will help provide a roadmap of where you're going. So no matter what you do, whether you have level of service goals or not, you're operating the utility, you're providing some type of service to your customers, but you may not really think about it in very specific terms <clears throat> of what you're providing them. So it's like driving on a road, and if I start in California and say I want to end up in Maine, there's a lot of different paths that can get me there. Um, there are some direct paths that will be the cheapest and most efficient, but I could go all the way up to, say, North Dakota and come back down to Texas and then go up to Michigan, and I could meander my way around the state, um, but that stays, but that's not going to be the most efficient. So when we set level service goals, we're trying to provide a much better direction, a clearer direction, and knowing which roads to go on and when, so we have a more efficient, effective service to our customers. We would want to have some goals that specifically relate to source water protection. There's a couple of examples on the screen there, but there are many, many other goals that you could have for source water protection. And when we add goals for source water protection specifically into our level of service uh, program, it will allow for greater visibility, accountability, importance, and equitability of source water with other programs that the utility is doing. So you maybe address pipe breaks, for example. Well, how does addressing pipe breaks relate to protecting the sources? Well, without having goals for each, it's a little bit more difficult for us to determine um, which one, you know, how they relate to each other in context. So it does allow for the measurement of source water goals, and it also allows for a discussion of what needs to happen if you're not meeting those goals, um, or what to do if the goals aren't met. Level service is a chance to have a conversation with customers about what's really important. And there are some tools available on our website, um, on the Southwest EFC website under asset management, we have a level of service tool that lists a whole bunch of different goals that you can set. And you can pick and choose any goals that you want off the list and you can set the target levels that best fit your facility. Moving on to the current state of the assets, that relates to source water characterization. So this gets into an inventory of the assets that you have. So we wanna know what assets we own, and there's a lot of assets. In this case, we're talking about them as gray assets or man-made assets, so tanks, pipe, uh, wells, valves, meters, all of that kind of stuff that makes up your system. We wanna know where those assets are located the condition of each asset, how much longer the asset will, will remain in service, and we call that the useful life remaining, the replacement cost of that asset. And then when we think about source water protection, some of those man-made assets that we were just talking about relate to source water protection. So some of them are both. They're a man-made asset that's meant to help our utility um, get its primary function of serving water to customers done but they also relate to source water protection. So just a couple of the gray assets that relate to source water protection are shown on the screen. There's many, many others. Um, but a fence around a wellhead, for example, that would keep people from getting into the wellhead and maybe causing a man-made contamination issue. Or if you're in agricultural areas and you have a fence around the wellhead, you might keep animals from the wellhead. Um, you can fence a bigger area to try to prevent any kind of um, contamination sources from getting there. And in wellhead design, uh, you can actually design wellheads to help protect, so maybe a concrete pad sloped away from the wellhead, um, the type of um, well that you construct, you know, the, the casing, et cetera, that you put in there can also be part of the protection measure. So these are man-made assets, but they also fit in the source water protection context. When we think about going beyond man-made assets, there are other things that maybe we don't consider assets, but they're very important in source water protection. So for example, we can have forested areas around wellheads, uh, I mean, um, around surface water sources. 
We can have grassy areas around wellheads that provide buffer zones. We can have vegetated areas that provide buffer zones. And you see some pictures on the screen of various types of those areas. And those natural assets, we didn't put them there, but they're very important to us. So we need to think of them as assets for our water utility because those assets are keeping our source water safe. Um, so we want to put those in our asset management program as well uh, because these are going to be doing a job for us. We might also have what we call green assets. And the only difference between green and natural that I want to draw your attention to is green assets are those things that are maybe man-made natural. Um, so plantings that we put there on purpose. Um, so they're vegetated areas or green areas that we purposely put there and they're planted with maybe specific plants or designed in a specific way to serve a function. Um, so if we have any of those that we're using for source water protection, we want to include those. And then finally, we might have some assets that we use as best management practice controls. And there could be several of those. These assets may not even be owned by us. There are things that folks might do on maybe their own property or their own business. And we're encouraging them to do that. Or maybe we were requiring somebody to do something. But they're their own assets. So we still want to know about them. And it's still possible to include assets in your inventory that maybe you don't own because you want to make sure that those assets work and do the job for you um, so you can still keep track of them in your asset management program. So some considerations about blending um, source water protection type assets into your general asset management inventory is how do we define green and natural assets as assets? It's not as simple as it might sound to say, well, how do we put buffer zones? You know, is it an acre of grass? Is it the grass itself that's causing, um, that is the asset? So how do we define those? And how do we combine green and natural assets with gray assets? Because our inventories are set up much more to be gray assets than green. So sometimes maybe the columns, column headings, types of information don't quite fit. And then understanding which green and natural assets are important for source water protection um, can be an issue so that, you know, the assets that are out there, which ones should we actually care about? This is a cultural change because we haven't really thought about assets in this way. We haven't, generally speaking, gone all the way to thinking about these green and natural assets as part of our overall system and how important we think they are. So I don't want to imply that it's super easy to include them, but I think this is the direction we need to go. And at the end of the presentation, I'll mention that we're working on a project to really help with this activity. We do have some tools available. At this point, most of these tools are related to the gray assets, more so than the green. Um, stay tuned, because we are going to be coming up with tools that will help you on the green and um, natural assets side as well. And we have an inventory spreadsheet. If you don't have any way to store your data, it can be a starting place for you. It's nothing special. It's just a spreadsheet. But some people have had have told us that they have difficulty just setting up spreadsheets. So we do have one available online if you need a starting place. Now let's move into criticality. And criticality ties to the action plan and implementation portions of source water protection. So when we look at criticality, there's two things we're looking at. What is the likelihood that an asset will fail? And what is the consequence if the asset does fail? So we want to rank probability of failure from one to five, with one being extremely low probability of failure and five being high. And you can use other sets of numbers, but this is just an easy example. And then consequence of failure the same way, one being a very low consequence, high being a very, uh, five being a very high consequence. And then to get criticality, we multiply probability of failure times consequence of failure, and that will give us an overall criticality or risk score. So if we have a score from one to five for each of the two probability and consequence items, that will give us an overall criticality or risk from one to 25. <coughs> to visualize risk, uh, we have a quad chart up here where probability of failure is on the um, horizontal axis and consequence of failures on the vertical axis. And then we have high risk assets shown in red <coughs> in the upper right-hand quadrant. Low risk assets are green in the lower left quadrant. 
and moderate assets are in yellow <coughs> in the middle. Now, why might we care about putting our assets in a chart like this? One reason we care is that we want to spend our money wisely. So those assets that are causing a high risk for us, meaning that something bad could happen and the consequence like a failure and the consequence would be very severe, we better be focusing time, money and effort in that area and driving the risk down and not spending so much time and effort in the low risk category um, because we really want to get a less risky um, uh, utility. If we're thinking about our uh, source water assets, we want the same sort of thing. What is the likelihood that our source water assets will fail? And what is the consequences if they do? So think about a forested area, a forested buffer zone around, <coughs> around a surface water source. What's the chance that that forested area might catch on fire? So what's the likelihood of a severe fire causing a burn? We lose that forested buffer zone. Maybe that puts a lot of silt into our surface water body, which creates a bunch of other problems. And then what's the consequence if that actually happens? You know, how bad would that be? So thinking through something like that green uh, grass buffer zone around the wellhead in that one picture, what's the chance that that grass maybe gets um, dies off for some reason or somebody cuts it down or um, something happens to that and it can't protect you from the agricultural sources. We wanna consider, would there be a potential for contamination to enter the well like it did in Walkerton? <coughs> so we really wanna think about the natural, um, natural and green assets in the same context that we think about our gray assets and what's the risk of those versus the risk of other assets. So if we look at this chart and think of all those blue dots as various assets in your utility. And in this particular example, there's a couple of assets in the upper right hand corner that will represent high risk assets. So what if the far upper right um, dot was some kind of uh, surface water or source water asset that would be extremely high risk and telling us that in the context of the rest of the utility, we should really be addressing that source water asset. So this would give you a chance to look at source water concerns in the context of the overall criticality of utility and help you better decide where to spend your money to protect your sources. Oops, we had a little glitch there. There we go. Okay, and there are tools available. Um, one of those tools is to help you assess the criticality of assets and it's available on our website. And there's also a tool related to inventory as well as risk analysis that's available on our website. If we move into life cycle costing, that re relates to the action plan, implementation and evaluation revision. So portions of all three of those are included in life cycle costing. So life cycle costing, we want to consider the entire life of the asset from all the way from when we're first thinking about that asset, all the way to replacing and decommissioning the asset. We don't always think of those assets as starting so early in the process. We sometimes think about the assets only after we get them and only after we're operating the facility, but we really wanna think about them much sooner in the pre-planning stages of things. And why is that? Like if we think about it in the first two boxes, highlighted in blue now, it turns out that that's the area where it costs us the least to make the most um, advantageous changes. So if there's something we can do in design in the future to help with source water protection, we should do it. And we can adjust the design uh, while it's still on paper without costing us very much. So there's a line at the bottom, if you look at the far left, that goes up to the top on the right, and that's our expenditure line item. So the expenditures go from very low as you're in planning to very high when you're in operation to have an influence. And the influence goes from very high in the planning stage to very low, meaning that once you get to the operation of the facility, things are pretty well locked in. There isn't a whole lot you can do at that point. You've got whatever assets you've got, you have whatever treatments you have, they're positioned wherever they are, they're made out of whatever material they are. 
So the more we think of our assets sooner in the process, the greater influence at the least amount of cost we have. So considering that source water protection in the initial design of all new sources or improved sources can be really beneficial. If there's anything we can do in the design phase to try to help prevent contamination, we should do that so that you know, that will help us protect our sources. So once we get our assets in place, we have to do operation maintenance, repair, replacement, rehabilitation. And the same is true for our natural or green assets. We might have to do some maintenance type activities to help protect our sources. So you know, what is included in the operation and maintenance of say natural assets or green assets? What would be included in, quote, the replacement or rehabilitation of natural assets? It's hard to think of natural assets in, in terms of replacement, but, you know, sometimes, like if a forest burns down, for example, we do have to do some kind of activities to replace that forest. Um, so what will we be doing? You know, what kind of plantings do we do? What do we have to do to treat the soil to try to help get that forest back in action? So some considerations, green infrastructure can be harder to maintain than gray. <coughs> and the green and natural infrastructure, uh, operation and maintenance, repair, those types of things, may require a very, tr very different skill set than the traditional operator may possess. Operators are used to working with concrete, steel, you know, man-made items, and a lot less so with a forest or grass, you know, that type of thing. So it might be a really good opportunity to integrate different departments or skill sets or different types of people or organizations that you can work with to help you with that maintenance. So for example, there might be forest restoration groups that you can work with if you have a forested area um, or if you have green areas, maybe you can work with the parks and recreation department. Maybe they can help you with that, with you know maintaining green buffers, um, grass buffers and that type of thing. And now finally, let's look at the long-term funding. And long-term funding relates to the implementation phase of source water protection. So we have to do budgets every year, and we really need to reconsider those budgets every year and make sure that we have you know, the right amounts of money and we're spending the money in the right places. And we want to think about whether source water protection is included in the budget. If it's not, should it be? If it's not, you know, why is it not included in there? So that gives you a chance to really look at your budget and say, is there a way we can add some source water protection activities into the budget? Um, I also wanted to share an example of using rates to support um, uh, source water protection. Uh, there's a facility called Central Arkansas Water. They're near, they're in the Little Rock, Arkansas area. And they were facing an issue where there's a lot of development pressures around Lake Lamel. Uh, which is one of the reservoirs that was um, serving them, and they were really concerned about the potential for uh, source water contamination in the future. They wanted to do more activities to protect the source water and ended up implementing a watershed protection fee of 45 cents per customer per month, and that brings in about a million dollars per year that they can then use to protect their sources. Um, their customers have been very supportive, and it has worked out very well for them. So if you really need to do some source water activities, you might want to consider, you know, is there a possibility to get funding through rates? Uh, for gray infrastructure, there are several funding sources, but many utilities use the two main ones, which are the Drinking Water State Revolving Loan Fund and the Rural Development Program through the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, those provide a lot of funding for gray infrastructure. When you include source water protection, you open up a lot of other partners and funders, many, many more than you have in the drinking water world. There are just a tiny fraction of the ones available on the screen right now, but you can think of all kinds of foundations and different non-government organizations, and there's a lot of people that can get involved depending on where you're located and what kind of um, source water protection area you have really look outside those traditional boundaries because you can open up a lot of possibilities. So consider adding some funding for source water protection in the budget and add as much as you need to do the type and nature of um, source water protection activities you have and then think about those outside funding sources. 
So there are resources to help. I've mentioned um, some already, but I wanted to mention a couple of others. So this is our website, um, the Southwest Environmental Finance Center website. Everything on our website is free to anybody. You can either get there through the URL that's on the screen, or you can search for Southwest EFC. We are the first thing that will come up. You can select services, and when you select services, there's a chance to pick source water protection. And I wanna draw you at your attention to the source water protection IQ tool that we created. Um, where the red circle is, if you click there, you can start the IQ process. It will look like this on the opening page. You pick section one, and you can answer the questions. There's a series of 15 questions with each answer worth zero to five points. So the total score possible is 75. And in each section, um, you will get a score for the section as well as a cumulative score. And it will help provide a um, baseline of where you are in the source water um, uh, planning and implementation process. And if you do the source water IQ over time, you can kind of see how you're improving. It includes seven sections, there's one more than the six that we've talked about before, and that's because the stakeholder involvement piece is included here, and we didn't specifically call out stakeholder involvement in our prior discussions. Um, you can print the results as well as responses to each question after you've finished it, and it's very important that you do that because we do not keep any data from anybody on our website. So as you're filling this out, if you download and print it, you can save a copy for yourself. Otherwise, your results will be lost after you leave. And this is just what the printout would look like. It would have your score. You can add your name and your utility's name, and it'll have your overall scores as well as the answers to each of your questions. And again, it's intended to provide you with a baseline or starting point um, wherever you're starting in the process and measure your progress over time. So similarly, there is an asset management IQ. So the same website, you go to asset management, to the AM IQ. There is a video um, explaining the process of the asset management IQ, and you can listen to that. Or you can click on either of these icons. This, um, there's two icons shown on screen. If you click on either of those, that will open up the asset management IQ. Um, it has a landing page, and then it has six different sections for which you can answer questions. So um, you click on the most correct answer for each question. You have a chance to get up to 150 points on this one because there's 30 questions, zero to five points each. And then you have the same opportunity to download the results as a PDF. It gives you the score for each section as well as your cumulative score. Um, and on the right-hand side, you can see a printout of what the Questions will look like when you print them out. And again, you'll have to save the PDF on your own computer or print it out in order to have a copy because we don't save them on our computer. So just to wrap up, uh, remember that the asset, management <coughs> pro the asset management concept provides a framework for the overall management of the utility. And source water protection measures are critical to keep the public safe and for long-term uh, protection and it's also cheaper than cleaning up after a contamination event has occurred. So blending source water protection into the asset management program of the utility is a really good thing to do because you get everything into one place and we're not thinking about source water protection in a vacuum uh, separately from all of the other activities that we're doing at the utility. And by bringing these things together, we can make sure that we're putting our funding, our effort, our time and our resources in the best way possible to get all the activities of our, um, of our utility done. So as I mentioned before, we're doing a lot more work in this area. This is kind of just a new area. Um, there's a Water Research Foundation program that's going on right now that we're not involved in directly, um, but working um, tangentially with them. And they're looking at this area of how can we blend green and natural assets into our asset management program, and we're also doing a major project for a philanthropic organization to look at giving tools and resources to communities who would like to do this, who would like to include asset management and source water protection in, <coughs> in their asset management program. So stay tuned there because we will be having over the next year and a half to two years, we'll have a lot more resources available 
to really help you characterize your natural green assets, to look at how to assess condition, useful life, et cetera, of those assets, thinking about operation and maintenance, thinking about replacement, all of those aspects of asset management, and how best to uh, blend, the, blend those two programs together. And also, thinking about green and natural assets, we're talking today about source water protection. But if you are doing other programs, such as combined sewers or um, stormwater protection, green and natural assets play a major role in those programs as well. So if your particular utility is more comprehensive than just drinking water, um, this program might be important to you from other aspects as well, um, in that it could address trying to prevent stormwater contamination, um, and also trying to reduce stormwater input to combined sewers. So with that, we'll close out the webinar today and open it up to any questions that you might have. So um, Tess, I'll ask you if any questions have come in thus far. So we're, um, looks like some people are in the process of typing in some questions. Uh, one thing that we can uh, just let you know off the bat is we had a um, some people ask about the getting the presentation, um, and uh, we will be putting the presentation on our website, efcnetwork.org, and we'll notify you when it's available via email um, to the same email address that you use to register for the webinar. So never fear, we'll make sure that you can have um, access to a PDF of the slides. Um, in the meantime, while you're typing in your questions, I just want to make sure you all get a chance to respond to our um, survey. We do look at these evaluations, so if you have a minute and you'd like to uh, tell us what you thought of the webinar, I'm going to send that to everyone. So feel free to look at that. And just quickly before we get to questions, we like to ask people about technical assistance. So one thing that we can offer um, through this project, the Smart Management for Small Water Systems project, is whether you know, if you know that you could use some help starting a source water protection plan, or even if you need to get a head start on asset management planning, um, or both, like we've discussed in this webinar, you can reach out to us and let us know, you know, someone, an expert like Heather might be able to walk you through the first steps. So just tell us yes, no, or not sure, and we can um, get in touch with you. Oh, and just uh, real quick for what the definition of a small system is. For the purpose of this grant, it's 10,000 population or fewer. So that addresses you know, a good percentage of water utilities across the United States, but we can provide free services to anybody 10,000 in population or fewer. Great, okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close this poll. Thanks for responding. Um, and the first question for you, Heather, um, is do you know any utilities that have already incorporated source water protection into asset management plans? And if so, do you, can you tell us a little bit about them? Well, I would say that I think we're on the cutting edge of this, and I think the answer is not quite yet. So there are pieces of it. And I would say like the Central Arkansas Water where they've started to do a little bit of that. It's still a little bit kind of um, side by side, um, but they're starting to blend theirs um, where they're doing activities on forest restoration and things like that, that are trying to protect the source water. And so they're doing some limited activities, but I don't think there's any good examples yet where it's been completely and fully integrated. Um, so, we're hoping that when we get our project um, into the beta testing phase that we will get some utilities who will agree to kind of do this with us and we'll have some really good examples at that time. So stay in touch with us. So hopefully in about maybe a year and a half to two years, we'll have some really good examples where utilities have gone down this path. Um, so we're hoping to get, and if you know anybody that would want to do a good beta test, if anybody online today, um, would like to be a beta testing utility, um, please let us know um, because we will be looking for folks. So if you have a source water protection program um, and an asset management program, and some of you it sounded like you did through the poll question, and you want to kind of be beta uh, where you would like to work with us, and this would all be for free um, through a different program that we have, please let me know. Um, 
through uh, through email or reach out to me after the webinar and we're happy to um, make the opportunity available to try to create some really good examples of where the two have been integrated. Awesome. So I do have one more question here. Um, you had mentioned the watershed protection fee. Can you, do you have any more information about what went into getting the protection fee established? Um, and do you know any other sources of funding that might be good for source water protection? Yeah, so the fee that I mentioned that Arkansas Water did, it's very interesting, um, and they have some great information um, uh, that they provided at various conferences and such about how they got this started. And it was really driven by their customers, which is uh, a very interesting and amazing part of the story is that when they saw that development pressures were really going to cause problems in the future and maybe add so much contamination that their surface water plant was not going to be able to handle it and they realized they had to do something and it could be extraordinarily expensive if it wasn't addressed the customers really came to them and said you know charge us a fee do what you have to do to protect our watershed because we need this water and they started with a fee of 45 cents that they thought customers would agree to. Um, it wasn't super um, uh, uh, thought out of it. That's exactly the amount of money they needed, but rather they thought that was something customers could be uh, able to pay and wouldn't complain too much. They, they're they actually raising it to 65 cents this year. And then I think they're looking at raising it again to maybe about a dollar. And that will give them quite a bit of money. And then they're they're proactively going out and buying key pieces of land around the lake. They're not using any coercive measures. They're not forcing anybody to sell. It's only voluntary. So when people want to sell the land, they'll come to the water utility and the water utility will buy the land if it's in a, a key protection zone. Um, and they've also teamed up with other funders. So it kind of answers the second part of your question is they've worked very closely with other types of funders like some forest programs where they've gotten some um, uh, grants from the US Forest Service, for example, to do some forest restoration activities in forested parts of the watershed to keep the danger of fire down. So there's quite a few. There's been some examples, like we had done some work with the National Park Service on a source water protection program in Texas, where the land around the lake was partially owned by the National Park Service and they actually own the key pieces of the lake. So we worked with them where they actually provided funding for some of the measures that the utilities wanted to put in place. There were several utilities that shared the lake source and there were some activities that needed to happen to protect the lake and they actually got the park service to pay for some of those activities because they were dual benefit. So they not only help the drinking water program but they help protect the environment so there are quite a few additional resources. Um, EPA has a clearinghouse of funding sources um, that you can search. I think if you search financial clearinghouse, you'll find it. If not, please contact me. I'll send you a direct link um, where you can actually look through different sources of funding for source water protection because they're, depending on what you're trying to do, you open up a lot of additional sources. So if it's a forested restoration type of thing, there's a lot of groups that deal with forests and you can work with them. If it's per purchasing conservation easements or buffer zones, there are people like the Trust for Public Land that you can work with um, who help you there. So there's, you know, depending on the activities you want to do, you can open up a lot of other doors to funding. Um, so consider like what Central Arkansas did where you can put a fee on a bill um, or also consider those outside funding sources that um, can really help you bring in some additional dollars beyond those traditional ways we fund, like the SRF program or the drinking water program. Great, thanks Heather. I think we're right at the um, end of our webinar today. So on that note, if there are more questions, um, please get in touch. We can always answer them after the webinar ends. But on that note, Heather, if you have any closing comments, please go ahead. Well, I just wanted to thank everybody from, for being here today. And again, I apologize for the quality, quality of my voice. And I'm sorry that um, sounds so scratchy today, but I appreciate you all listening in. 
And please follow up again if you have an interest in being a beta test utility in the future or you want more information, you know, please uh, watch as we uh, expand our role in this uh, area of blending source water and asset management. And we'll be sharing more in the, fu in the future. Great. Thanks, everyone. <coughs> Thank you, Tess.